Please turn your attention to the word provided by Dr. King. Ah, what a powerful, powerful artistic display that is so relevant to uh, our culture, our history, and this time that we celebrate uh, in African American history. Let's give those young people another round of applause. <laughs> You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I am so delighted to be here on today. And um, it, took a, uh, it took a minute to finally uh, get here. Uh, Mother King, I started yesterday at 6 in the morning and had to drive from Massachusetts to New York City. Uh, to do a funeral for one of our deacons that passed and then get back from New York back to Hartford in time to catch a flight uh, that connected in Charlotte, got delayed, and then finally got here to Chicago around midnight uh, and to the hotel about 1 a.m. and then finally drifted off to sleep. Uh, but as Miss Seely said, in the color purple, I may be poor, I'm black. I may even be ugly, but I'm here. <laughs> Amen. And certainly I thank God for being here. Praise the Lord for my friend and your wonderful pastor. Help me celebrate Dr. Carl King. man of great integrity uh, and I can say that because I've seen a few things um, and I've been around leaders and I know that we're all flawed individuals uh, but I can say unequivocally that this is a man who really believes the word of the Lord and believes in living according to the word of the Lord and I thank God for his example. Great leader in our church and um, um, dedicated to the work here, but also of our national church as well. Uh, and I praise God for his friendship uh, and for his leadership. And certainly want to praise God for his lovely wife, Dr. Jean Porter King. Amen. walks beside him. Uh, I often tell folk that um, that they that their theological perspective is skewed sometimes because sometimes we have some sayings that aren't biblically sound and they, they often say that behind every great man is a great woman. Um, but when I do a cursory review of scripture and I go back to the book of beginnings Bible tells me that God put Adam to sleep. Uh, and he, he didn't take a bone out of his back because he didn't intend for the woman to walk behind him. He, he, he didn't take anything out the front because he definitely didn't want her to walk in front of him. Uh -huh. But he put him to sleep and he took a bone out the side because uh, he wanted her to walk beside him. And, um, and when Adam woke up and he saw her, and I know, you know, the scripture says he called her woman uh, because she came out of the womb of man, but uh, in the TWS 2 version of the Bible, that's the Talbert Swan version. <laughs> I believe that he just looked at her and he said, whoa, man. <laughs> and that was that, amen. And so certainly I, I believe that's what Carl said a few years ago, whoa, 
Man. Amen. And so we thank God for his wife. And um, certainly I honor my wife in her absence, our First Lady Cynthia Swan, and praise God for her uh, and our children and our family. Uh, to all of the uh, ministerial staff, certainly thank God for uh, Elder King Sr., amen, and, and for Mother King, good to see you today. Praise God for you. And I was surprised to see, but thank God to see Reverend Andrea Phillips here this morning. And uh, she was part of our ministerial team at Spring of Hope years ago uh, until a job as a chaplain here in the Illinois area brought her here. And so I'm so delighted to see her here on this morning. Amen. Well, Dr. King uh, told me three times, I assume... <clears throat> He really wanted to reiterate it because uh, usually when people are repetitive about things that they tell you, they, 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 they want to make sure that you got the point. And he told me about three times the approximate time that you all get out of church. And uh, although he didn't say, Bishop, you have X amount of time to preach, I think he was underscoring that to let me know that I intend for us to get out when we get out, Negro. So... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I want to share with you this morning uh, Jeremiah 38 verses 6 to 13 and uh, those that are physically able if you would stand in reverence to the reading of the word Jeremiah 38 beginning at verse number 6 <clears throat> so they took Jeremiah put him in the cistern of Malchijah the king's son which was in the courtyard of the guard they lowered Jeremiah by ropes into the cistern, and it had no water in it, only mud. And Jeremiah sank down into the mud, but Ebed-Melech, a Cushite, an official in the royal palace, heard that they had put Jeremiah into the cistern while the king was sitting in the Benjamin gate. Ebed-Melech went out, of the palace and said to him, my lord the king, these men have acted wickedly in all they have done to Jeremiah the prophet. They have thrown him into a cistern where he will starve to death when there is no longer any bread in the city. Then the king commanded Ebek Melech the Cushite, take 30 men from here with you, lift Jeremiah the prophet out of the cistern before he dies. So Ebed-Melech took the men with him and went to a room under the treasury in the palace. He took some old rags and worn out clothes from there, let them down with ropes to Jeremiah in the cistern. Ebed-Melech the Cushite said to Jeremiah, put these old rags and worn out clothes under your arms to pad the ropes. Jeremiah did so. And they pulled him up with the ropes and lifted him out of the cistern. And Jeremiah remained in the courtyard of the guard. Before you sit down, I want you to just look at somebody in the eye. And uh, if you owe them some money and you can't look them in the eye, just look at the bridge of their nose. And say, neighbor, when God... Uh, uses rags you may be seated in the presence of the Lord when God uses rags sisters and brothers one of the most important things to remember as you travel uh, through the journey of life is that your circumstances don't have to dictate your destiny uh, the situation you find yourself in now does not mean you're destined to stay that way. And it's important to, to note uh, that, we, that we don't line up our confession with our circumstances, but we line up our confession with God's word. Your circumstances might say, broke, but God's word says, my God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory. Your situation says you're sick, but God's word says, by his stripes, 
we are healed. Your situation says you're in this thing all by yourself. But God's word says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Your situation says you aren't worth very much. You don't have anything to live for. But God's word says you are fearfully and wonderfully made. So don't line up your confession with your circumstance. Line up your confession with God's word. You see, you can be on welfare, but you don't have to have a welfare mind. One that believes you're supposed to receive and spend rather than work and save. See, a welfare mind is one that is content to just get by from month to month without any dreams, determination, hope, or vision of doing better. See, you can, you can be poor, but your mind doesn't have to be an impoverished mind. You can be a janitor, a waitress, a sales clerk, or a servant and have what some people would refer to as a menial job as long as you remember that a janitor, a waitress, a clerk, a mail handler, or a servant is what you do to earn a living. It's not what you are. Uh, matter of fact, just tell somebody, that's what I do. That's not what I am. Uh, well, Bishop, who am I? I'm glad you asked. Uh, you're God's child of character and commitment, of intelligence and integrity. Uh, you are a big person that just happens to be occupying a small spot. Because you know who and what you are, you don't allow your surroundings to determine your self-worth. You can be bigger than where you are and bigger than even those that are around you. And in this particular text is a case in point for the prophet. Uh, Jeremiah had been imprisoned because he had told the truth. He had learned the hard way that everyone who claims to want to hear the truth doesn't really want to hear it. And more often than not, people want to hear their own opinions and their views agreed to by others. And, but if you want to get into trouble with some folk, if you want to lose friendships with some people, just tell them the truth. You see, most of us go through life deciding between the truth and the politically wise thing to say between the truth that angers and offends and uh, uh, what is stretched or left unsaid, the truth that causes conflict or what consoles and doesn't create any waves. And Jeremiah was one of those persons who made people nervous because he was determined to tell the truth as he saw it. Tact was not his thing. Truth was his thing. Politics were not his thing. Principles were his thing. Ingenuity was not his thing, but integrity was his thing. Slyness was not Jeremiah's thing, but sincerity was his thing. He, he, he didn't do game playing. Uh, uh, he, he wanted to be genuine. And, and so you wouldn't want to ask Jeremiah his opinion uh, about that outfit that was too tight or too gaudy yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, because he would tell you the truth. You wouldn't want to ask his opinion of your family or them uh, nappy head bad cheering you got. Because he would tell you the truth. You wouldn't want to ask his opinion of you, your lifestyle, and your values because he would tell you the truth. And if you were the king, you wouldn't want to ask Jeremiah his opinion about your policies because he would tell you. And that was the mistake that King Zedekiah of Judah made when the Babylonians were preparing to attack Jerusalem. Zedekiah was preparing to hold out, but because Jeremiah believed the judgment of God was upon Judah, he advocated Surrender. Some of the king's counselors got nervous. Some of his, his top officials who had the most to lose felt that Jeremiah shouldn't be openly preaching a message of surrender and defeat and discouraging the hearts of the people and the morale of the soldiers. And so they got a hold of Jeremiah and they imprisoned him. They lowered him into a well with no water and left him there to die. And Jeremiah sank down in the mud. 
They said, in other words, Jeremiah, you're not going to go and bring this report to the king because we got too much to lose. So rather than you tell the truth, we'll just silence your voice. And many times that's what the enemy wants to do when you speak truth is try to silence your voice. Now just picture Jeremiah here for a moment. The devoted, uncompromising prophet of truth sinking down into the mud. Sisters and brothers, I got to tell you that every life spends some time in the mud. Uh, now, now, don't get it twisted. Uh, don't think you're so holy. Uh, some of y'all looking at me like pious peacocks of righteousness. Don't think you're so sanctified and so saved that you won't spend any time in the mud. Because if you're a person of faith, if you are a true follower of Jesus Christ, you can't walk this Christian way on flower beds of ease. You can't get through the piano of life with all sharps and no flats. You can't make it along this journey without conflict. You will spend some time in the mud. Your faith hasn't really been tried until you spend some time in the mud. And if you read the biographies of great men and women, you will discover that before they made their great discovery, before they wrote their great literary masterpiece or their musical score, painted the picture that carved them a place in immortality, they spent some time in the mud. Before they were inducted into the Hall of Fame or accomplished the great feats for which they are known uh, or saw their dreams come true, they spent some time in the mud. They felt themselves sinking in the mud where all seemed lost, where they felt forsaken and forlorn, where their lives seemed to be in vain and dreams seemed impossible to attain. Sometimes life and misfortune puts us in the mud. Sometimes our own miscalculations, our own mistakes, and our own weaknesses, our own sins, and our own flaws put us in the mud. Sometimes other people through meanness or envy or fear or resentment put us in the mud. Sometimes the enemy's attempts to break our faith and our spirit puts us in the mud. And I want to tell you, there's some mud on all of us. Mm -hmm. Every marriage that survives got some mud on it. Oh, y'all ain't going to help me here. I, I always tell folk that me and my wife have not had one single argument. All of our arguments have been doubled. Y'all won't help me preach in here now. But any marriage that survives got some mud on it. Every friendship or relationship of substance has some mud on it. Every dream that is realized has some mud on it. Every career, no matter how successful, has some mud on it. A faith strong and holy, noble and cleaned up has some mud on it. Mud that clings and mud that stinks and mud that stains and every life goes through the mud and can't you see Jeremiah in the mud asking the Lord why do the wicked prosper and scoundrels enjoy peace but I'm here in the mud see Joseph. Can't you see Joseph when he was lowered into the pit by his jealous brothers in the mud? Can't you see King David playing crazy just to save his life in the mud? Can't you see Abraham lying instead of believing to protect himself in the mud? Can't you see Noah the most righteous of his generation lying outside drunk and naked in the mud. Can't you see Elijah running away from Jezebel right after he got done defeating the prophets of Baal, but now he's running in the mud. 
Can't you see John the Baptist locked up in prison, awaiting death, wondering if Jesus is who he thought he was? In the mud, can't you see Peter cursing and denying his Lord? Then going off by himself, weeping bitterly in the mud. Uh, have you ever been there? Do I have some real folk not on that side? Have you ever been there? In the mud? When it seems as though God has turned a deaf ear to your prayer? When living right and doing right doesn't seem to do any good after all? For the harder you try, the deeper it seems that you sink in the mud where sin has you and you can't get out. When you find yourself in the mud, there are a few things that you need to know. First of all, when you find yourself in the mud, remember this truth. You don't have to live in the mud. Just tell somebody, you ain't got to live in the mud. No matter how long you've been there, no matter how many times you've tried and failed to get out, the mud ain't your home. You don't have to live in the mud. Uh, 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 that's the message that somebody needs to take to straying daughters and wayward sons and fallen wives and backslidden husbands uh, that you ain't got to live in the mud. Uh, some of us have messed up careers and lost jobs and positions and broken the hearts of those that loved us, disappointed those that believed in us. The mud is where we seem to have been living, but we ain't got to live in the mud. Some of us are sick and have been told by the enemy that we aren't worth much and can't be productive, but don't believe it because you don't have to live in the mud. And whenever you find yourself in the mud for any reason, take a good long look at yourself in the mirror and say, the devil is a liar. I don't have to live in the mud. Oh, because God can still make a way for me. Jesus' blood can still save me. The Holy Spirit can still work a miracle within me and upon me. The mud is not my home. I'm not dead yet. I still have a chance for recovery. I still have a chance for wholeness and healing for health. The mud is not my home. If God brought others out, God can bring me out. I don't have to live in the mud. Even in the mud, God is still good all the time. Therefore, the mud ought not be, will not be, cannot be. I'm not going to let it be where I live. You've got to refuse to let somebody else's prediction become your reality. Just because they call you stupid don't mean you are. Huh? Your expectation has to always extend beyond what others say or do. God does not want us to live thinking that the mud is our home. It's time for us to leap past the mindset that this circumstance is my lot in life. Well, what do I need to do, preacher? I'm glad you asked. You've got to take your misery and make music out of it. Uh, you've got to take your irritation and transform it into inspiration. You've got to take your anger and make it into assurance. You take your bitterness and make it bless you. And you turn your problems into praises. Uh, your disabilities into deliverance and fashion your pain into a prayer and determine in your mind I'm not accepting the mud as my home. Well let me work it for a moment this is all about resolving in your mind settling in your spirit that you're going to move past the label, past the legacy, past the lies that others have predetermined for you. It involves refusing to live in the limitation or reside in the restriction or continue to drive on the dangerous roads of disappointment. You see at some point you've got to learn how to prophesy over your own life. Stop trying to get a word from everybody else when God has already given you a word and you got to speak a word over your own life. You got to learn how to step over the line and not look back or slow down or back away or be still knowing that your past has already been redeemed, uh, that your present is prosperous, your future is secure in Christ Jesus. You got to resolve that you are 
done with low living and sight walking and small planning and smooth knees and colorless dreams and faded vision and mundane talking and cheap giving and dwarf goals. You got to resolve that you will no longer need prominence or position or plaudits or popularity to be who you're trying to be or do what God has called you to do. Uh, that you don't, oh my God, you don't have to be right, first, tops, regarded, recognized, or rewarded, that you're going to walk by faith, live in love, work without fear, and hold on to God's unchanging hand. Though your road may be rough and your companions may be few, your God is reliable. Your mission is clear. You've got to determine at some point, way down in your sanctified soul, that you can't be bought, sold, uh, Compromise, detoured, uh, lured away, turned back, deluded or delayed. That you will not flinch in the face of adversity, hesitate in the presence of trouble, negotiate at the table of the enemy, or meander in a maze of mediocrity. That you won't give up, shut up, let up, or slow up until you stood up, prayed up, paid up, spoken up for the cause of Christ. You've got to determine, I'm not living here no more. Y'all sit down. It's rude to stand while somebody's preaching. You see, although Jeremiah was stuck in the mud, he was still important and significant to God. And that's a word for some of you who are here today who've been dropped and dumped and dismissed and discarded and left behind and kicked to the curb. Don't you ever tie the meaning and the value of your life and your experience to the conflicts, opinions, and attitudes uh, that other people have about you. Don't let them prognosticate about your future because your meaning, your significance, your value ought not be determined by other folk. It ought to be determined by your God. When people see you as useless, God sees you as useful. Uh, you are significant to God. Matter of fact, turn to somebody and tell them, I'm significant to God. Uh, I'm meaningful to God. Uh, I'm loved by God. Turn to somebody else and tell them, when you see me, you ain't seen nothing like this before. Uh, when God made this, God broke the mold. But here in our text, we see Jeremiah feeling forsaken, forlorn, sinking in the mud. What's fascinating about God is that, watch this, while Jeremiah is sinking, help was already on the way. I think they got it over here. I don't think, I think y'all slow. I, I, I said, while Jeremiah was sinking, help was already on the way. And, and, and so my second point, my sisters and brothers, is that help will come from an unexpected place. That ought to bless somebody right there. Watch this, watch this, watch this. It's Black History Month, right? Watch this. In the king's household, there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a son of Africa, a black man named Ebed Melech, who respected Jeremiah. And he went to the king to plead on Jeremiah's behalf. Watch this. When Jeremiah's own people had put this prophet in the mud, it was a brother from Africa who went to see about getting him out. See, virtue defends and appreciates virtue. For Ebed Melech to defend Jeremiah, he had to be virtuous like the prophet was. He had to have Jeremiah's integrity and honesty. He also had to have courage and conviction like Jeremiah. 
The uncivilized among Jeremiah's own people put him in the mud, but it was a humane, refined, articulate, intelligent brother named Ebed Melech who understood that he was bigger than his surroundings who tried to get the prophet out the mud. Now, he may not have had all of the riches that others had, but he was not impoverished in his thinking and he was not poor in his spirit. He knew he was God's child and he told the king that those that put Jeremiah in the mud had acted wickedly against him and the king gave him permission to save the prophet. Jeremiah was left for dead and he was as good as dead in the minds of those who dumped him, who dropped him, who discounted him, who discarded him, who dismissed him. He was easy prey for any predator who wanted to take him out, and yet he remained alive. God kept the vultures, the lions, the bears, the wolves, the snakes, the hyenas away from him. God kept him alive when he should have been dead. And I just wonder today, if there's anybody in here today who's not ashamed to testify that God kept you alive when you were in your weakened condition. Oh, you ought to go ahead and testify and look at your neighbor and say, God kept me alive. Oh, if you ever again doubt uh, your importance or your value, all you got to do is look back over your shoulder and see what God has already brought you through and what God has already kept you from. Just look over your shoulder and remember when nobody thought you would make it. And really, if the truth be told, you doubted your own survival. And yet God kept you in the midst of it all because you are somebody special to God. Uh, oh, is that somebody's testimony in here today? Uh, you're looking at your life and saying, my haters said I'd never make it. My enemies thought I was gone. My critics said I didn't matter. Oh, they did everything they could to hurt me and destroy me and discourage me and ruin my reputation. But some way, somehow, God kept me alive I must be somebody special uh, and see you see being left for dead doesn't mean that you gotta die and see God is keeping you alive because you have value you have meaning you have significance Jeremiah was so special that God sent help from an unexpected source the king gave Ebed Melek permission to save Jeremiah the last place he expected help from was a representative of the king. But I'm here to tell you that God will make your enemy your footstool. He'll prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemy. He'll make your haters your elevator. God will send help where you least expect it. Uh, well, I just came to tell somebody this morning, there's help with comfort in times of loneliness. There's help with comfort in times of sorrow. There's help with relief in times of suffering. There's help with guidance in times of decision. There's help with protection in times of danger. There's help with courage in times of fear. There's help with peace in times of turmoil. There's help with rest in times of weariness. There's help with strength in times of temptation. There's help with warning in times of indifference. Tap somebody and tell them help is on the way. So God sent the prophet help in his time of need. And what I like about this text is not only did God send help from an unexpected place, but God sent help in a way that was unexpected. See, often we expect God to work things out in some miraculous, supernatural way. But this time, God didn't take heat out of the fire like he did for the Hebrew boys. He didn't close the mouth of hungry lions like he did for Daniel. God didn't part the Red Sea like he did for Moses and the children of Israel. He didn't give Ebed Melech a staff like he gave to Moses. He, he didn't have a slingshot like David had. He didn't have an arrow or some type of weapon, but 
Ebed Melech didn't even have a ladder to rescue Jeremiah. So the Bible says he went to the storehouse and watch this. He gathered some rags. Everybody say some rags. And some worn out clothes. And he let them down to Jeremiah in the cistern by ropes. Then he told the prophet to put the rags under his armpits. Between his body and the ropes. And then he lifted the prophet from the mud with rags and ropes. And so my final point, my sisters and my brothers, tap somebody and tell them God can lift you with rags and ropes. Oh, he didn't have any sophisticated equipment. He, he, he didn't need any. He, he, he used what was available to him, rags and ropes. And although his equipment may not have been the best, his rags and ropes were sufficient to get the job done. And some of us know what it's like to be saved by rags and ropes. You see, you see, 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 when others took the ham and ate high off the hog, we took the rags and ropes, the feet, the ears, the tail, and the chitterlings. Come on, somebody. And fed ourselves until times got better. Some of us made it through school not only because of the scholarships we received, but because of the rag and rope donations that somebody gave us. Do I have a witness in the house? I know some of y'all made it through summa cum laude. Some of y'all made it through magna cum laude. But some of us just made it through thank you laude. Because we got through on rags and ropes. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Our colleges and our schools were built by rag and rope donations. Our churches were not endowed, but we survived and thrived because faithful, hardworking, Holy Spirit-filled people bring their little rag and rope offering. Oh, come on, somebody. And they seem small when we tie them together. They become great. Oh, see, the Lord has a way of stretching your rags and your ropes and, and being able to save us. See, we're not saved by some great liturgical act or by some marvelous intellectual theory, but by a carpenter's son who spent his life and his ministry with people in the mud. Oh, he hung out with stinky fishermen, with Galilean sod busters, uh, with people who could barely make it. Uh, oh, they were muddy people, but my God, they made it on rags and ropes. Uh, Oh, he called a, a tax collector named Zacchaeus. He called lepers and prostitutes. He even called a dying thief. Oh, but one day mm, on a hill called Calvary, he bore a rag and a rope cross and died. Oh, I got to get out of here. Uh, for my sins, uh, he came to where we were in the mud. Uh, and he lifted us from grime to grace. He lifted us from sin to salvation. He lifted us from helplessness to hope. He lifted us from failure to faith, from trouble to triumph, from vice to victory, and from hell to heaven. Bless his name. Uh, and all we needed uh, was some rags uh, and some ropes. Um, uh, and so when you see me praising God, uh, oh my God, uh, don't call me emotional, uh, but just understand uh, that I've been lifted uh, with rags. Uh, and ropes uh, when you see me give my tithe and my offering uh, don't think I'm being foolish uh, just understand uh, that I've been lifted uh, with rags uh, 
and ropes. Bless his name. And that's what our faith is about. It's about the Savior lifting us up with rags and ropes. I heard the songwriter say, on a hill far away stood an old uh, rugged cross um, uh, an emblem uh, of suffering and shame uh, but I love that old cross um, uh, where the dearest and the best um, uh, for a world of lost sinners was slain uh, I will cherish um, uh, the old rugged cross um, uh, till my trophies uh, one day I'll lay down uh, I will cling uh, to the old rugged cross um, uh, and exchange it uh, one day for a crown. Uh, is there anybody in here uh, that can testify uh, that I have been lifted uh, with rags um, uh, and ropes um, uh, when I didn't know how, how I was going to make it uh, when family couldn't help me uh, and the church couldn't help uh, some it uh, lifted me uh, out the mud, uh, out the muck, uh, out the mire, uh, and placed my feet uh, upon a solid rock. Uh, I heard the songwriter say, uh, I was sinking uh, deep in sin, uh, far uh, from the peaceful shore, uh, very deeply uh, stained within, uh, sinking to rise no more uh, but the master of the sea uh, he heard uh, my despairing cry uh, from the water uh, he lifted me uh, and now uh, saving my uh, lean on your neighbor uh, and say love lifted me uh, love lifted me uh, when nothing else would help uh, love I'm sorry y'all uh, I'm acting like I'm in a spring of hope uh, love lifted me uh, and because uh, he lifted me uh, because uh, he brought me uh, because uh, he taught me uh, because uh, he kept me uh, because uh, he never left me uh, because uh, he lifted me uh, I'm gonna lift him uh, yeah yeah the songwriter said uh, how to reach uh, the masses uh, men of every birth uh, for an answer uh, Jesus gave the key uh, he said if I if I if I be lifted uh, from the earth uh, I'll draw uh, to me. Uh, let's lift him up. Lift Jesus up uh, till he speaks uh, from eternity. Uh, lean on your neighbor uh, and say neighbor uh, neighbor y'all didn't say it like I said it. <laughs> lean on somebody else and say neighbor I feel uh, like lifting him. Uh, I feel uh, like giving him glory. Uh, I feel uh, like lifting my hand. Uh, I feel uh, like stomping my feet. Uh, I feel uh, like dancing my dance. Uh, because Lord, uh, the Lord uh, has been good to me. Uh, the Lord uh, has brought me uh, the light. Lean on somebody and say, you better watch out. I feel a praise coming on.
Matter of fact, I just need you to check the area around you. Look at somebody say atmosphere check. I'm just trying to see if this role is conducive for worship. Now look at somebody and tell them, if you don't like praise, I'm going to give you about 20 seconds to find you another seat. Because when I dance my dance, I might just step on your toe. Huh? I might say hallelujah uh, all up in your face. Uh, bless his name. Uh, but the Lord uh, has been too good to me uh, for me not to praise him, uh, for me not to give him glory, uh, for me not to worship him. Uh, he lifted me uh, with rags and ropes. Uh, yeah. believe that if anybody ought to bless the Lord you folk with melanin in your skin ought to be able to look back at where the Lord brought us from when he brought us here and we couldn't speak their language but God raised up somebody they may have been white in color, but they taught us how to read. And when they taught us how to read, they picked up the Bible. And they taught us, slaves, be obedient to your master. But they didn't know once we learned how to read, we were going to turn over and find out about Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro. They didn't know we were going to find out about Moses and the children of Israel uh, and God bringing them out of bondage. Uh, and without one weapon, God put white man against white man to set black man free. Uh, if anybody's got a reason to praise God, uh, we got a reason to give God praise. I got to get out of here. I got to leave you. But can I just give you, can I just give you 10 reasons? Real, real quick, 10 reasons why you ought to give God praise. Can, 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 y'all don't want to hear it over here. Can I give y'all 10 reasons? I give you 10 reasons. Okay. One, he woke you up this morning. Two, he woke you up this morning. Three, he woke you up this morning. Four, he woke you up this morning. Five. He woke you up this morning. Six. He woke you up this morning. Seven. He woke you up this morning. Eight, nine, ten. He woke you up this morning. You ought to give him praise. Thank you.
whole thing, I promise you, you know, in Church of God in Christ, we get four closes. Look at your neighbor and say, this is the last time he's going to close. But can I give you the test of why you ought to praise him? Put your hand in front of your face like this. And just go like this. <sighs> Did you feel that? Yeah. That was breath. Yeah. Let everything. Everything. joining our broadcast today. For additional information, please visit us on our website, our Facebook page, or Twitter.